Good evening, and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know. We are online at commonwealthclub.org, on Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. My name is Frank Meerkamp, and I'm a Managing Director for Artificial Intelligence at Accenture. I also proudly serve as a board member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors. Accenture is a global management consulting and technology services company, and we are thrilled to support and sponsor this important program. Joining us at the Commonwealth Club today is artificial intelligence expert Jerry Kaplan, to my left, who is widely known as a serial entrepreneur, technical innovator, popular author, and futurist. He co-founded four Silicon Valley startups, two of which became publicly traded companies. His best-selling non-fiction novel, Startup, a Silicon Valley Adventure, was selected by Business Week as one of the top 10 business books of the year. Dr. Kaplan is currently a fellow at the Center for Legal Informatics at Stanford University Law School. He also teaches as a visiting lecturer in Stanford's top-ranked computer science department. His newest book, Artificial Intelligence, What Everyone Needs to Know, discusses how over the coming decades, artificial intelligence will profoundly impact the way we live, work, wage war, seek a mate, educate our young, and care for our elderly. Joining Dr. Kaplan to moderate this conversation is John Markov, a technology reporter for the New York Times. Join us as we discuss just how much should humans entrust to machines. Now, please join me in welcoming John Markov in conversation with Dr. Jerry Kaplan. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming. And, uh, I, a couple of just, uh, I guess, um, asterisks before we start. First of all, uh, just truth in advertising, it's, it's, I'm an emeritus reporter, or a former reporter in New York Times. I actually retired uh, last month, so after 30 years, so just uh, to make things clear. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and, and a, a second note, it was not an early retirement either. So, so uh, and uh, just, uh, a couple of parenthetical remarks about Jerry before we start as well. One is, you know, th those companies that he founded were uh, amongst the first AI companies in Silicon Valley in the 1980s during something which we could consider the AI spring. And we'll get into that. But um, I think it's, it's, it's sort of fair to start out by asking him, now that he's writing books, if he sort of didn't get it backwards. Shouldn't you have actually written the books then and started the companies now? Wouldn't that have made more sense? <laughs> Uh, let's just say startups are a young man's game. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. But um, one of the companies was Technology, which stayed around for a long, long time. The other one was Symantec, which most of you know is an antivirus company, but it actually started as an AI company, right? Is that? I, I did an early product. I was not. A well, but you, you were a, you were technically a co-founder, te right? Technically a co-founder of the very first incarnation of Symantec. But yeah. it was an AI product too, as well. Yes, it was. was. Yeah. Natural Start language access to databases. Yeah. 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 So what put you in, in, in Stanford, at Stanford in the 1980s? You came as an AI person, right, first? Yes, I was a research associate. I graduated, I got a PhD in artificial intelligence, computer science from the University of Pennsylvania. And they hired me there as a you know, research associate, yes. And what brought, you to, what brought you to AI? Why were you an AI researcher in the 1980s? Nobody really, you know, the world was, had not yet come to AI then. Yeah, but I knew it was going to be really cool. <laughs> Look, I, I, this, this is no joke. I was a senior in high school, and uh, me and two other friends went uh, to see a movie that had just come out. It was called 2001, A Space Odyssey. And we saw it like six times in Cinerama and in Times Square. And it, we were just, I was so blown away by the movie, and particularly by the HAL 9000, you may remember. I'm sorry, Dave. So there were three of us, that. and uh, one of them became a, uh, I won't name them, but one of them became a, a famous uh, Hollywood director. Uh, I decided I had to build that machine. He, he decided he had to make the movie. I decided I had to build that machine. And uh, the third guy became a dentist. <laughs> 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 but, I, I mean, I've actually run into a lot of people who had the same reaction, who went into, I mean, 
uh, Hal, Hal, Space Odyssey, drove a lot of people into AI too, early AI researchers. And to me, it's a curious reaction. I mean, I saw Hal. I mean, Hal was kind of a menacing figure. What, what yes. made you want to build a creature that could sort of destroy humans right at the start of the... Was that, that's not the reaction you had. I'm not sure that was the goal of designing that uh, in the movie. Uh, but it is actually very interesting how mistaken the view of artificial intelligence was back then. And if you go back and you watch that movie and you realize, you go through the plot and think about how people, the people who were supposedly the experts in artificial intelligence, how they thought about the field and how that bled into the movie by Stanley Kubrick, it's incredible how different it is today uh, than, it, than it was then. Uh, in that movie film, I'm not going to review the whole plot for you, but uh, the reason that they were going to shut down the computer is it had made a mistake. It had predicted that a uh, uh, communications module would, would fail in 96 hours or something like that. And they were so astounded that the computer had made a mistake. A computer had made a mistake that they felt they had to shut it down because that was too dangerous. Well, I... Today, that's completely ridiculous. Everybody knows computers mostly make mistakes. So uh, it was but a it, different it, view of the world. It's generally interesting to me, I mean, that, that there's this kind of co-evolution between Hollywood and the systems we design. Um, yes. The, other, the only example I can think of at the moment, I keep running into people in the field who are inspired by things they saw. Uh -huh. the, the ones that come to mind at the moment is the two designers of Siri yes. were directly inspired by an Apple promotional video called Knowledge Navigator. Right. Um, and they decided they were going to go build that, and as a result, we have Siri. But, so what is it about this? Well, you know, the Knowledge Navigator was, I mean, I was there, uh, not at Apple, but John Scully, that was his reaction to the product we were working on at Go Corporation. Uh, yeah. So, there's, there's, he said, well, there's you, know, a lot we, of you can build that product? Well, we can do a great video. And he was right, they did a great video. Yeah. So, so t take us back, that, that period when you started was called the AI Spring, and I'm asking for a reason. Mm -hmm. There was tremendous enthusiasm on a much smaller scale about yes. the impact of AI. And then it was followed by something called the AI Winter. Correct. And I'm looking for whether you see parallels in the, the, the sort of explosive interest that we have in AI today. Uh, there's a parallel, but not. I don't think the outcome is going to be the same. The, the mistaken view that the people who, it was uh, Marvin Minsky that advised on 2001 A Space Odyssey, and that uh, created the great hype bubble, which we are calling the spring, uh, in the early, what decade was that? 80s, <laughs> 1980s? Uh, you know, I was, uh, unfortunately, I admit I was a party to this, this whole thing. I was one of the early AI companies that we had started, yeah. you know, for an expert systems company. Their theory of what artificial intelligence was, the founders of the field, was that logic and reasoning was the basis of human intelligence. And that happened because the founders of the field were mathematicians, and they were interested in mathematical logic. Also, I would say, and I, you knew them as well as I did, if not better, um, and they're gone now, so they can't defend themselves. Let's just say that they may have been somewhere on the autism spectrum. You know, they weren't very <laughs> socially engaged in, in a normal way. And so they believed that logic was the basis of uh, what made us human and made us intelligent and different from the animals. And so there was a whole, uh, that whole wave of expert systems were based on rule-based systems, logical reasoning, symbolic thought, and that had solved certain classes of problems and not others. But as you know, there were te other technologies around the wings at that time, which were roundly uh, uh, dismissed. And now, uh, 40 years later, approximately, uh, those have now uh, become the mainstream of artificial intelligence, uh, particularly the area of machine learning um, and neural networks and a whole variety of related, related techniques. And those are now uh, seeing the same kind of renaissance in spring with the same mistaken idea that that is the basis of human intelligence. So that's the commonality. Uh, there's something about people in the field of AI that they love to hype this stuff up. They love the attention. And the truth is that this is good for certain classes of problems and not for others. The difference is the classes of problems that these are being solved, going to be solved today by these new technologies are really quite valuable. But this notion of overpromise and underdeliver. Yes. Today, what's different is these machines are actually doing things that are useful. I mean, they're, they're having a big impact on society. 
They but will. Have they overpromised again? I mean, yes. let me. Uh, <laughs> Elon Absolutely. Musk, uh, I think last year, perhaps the year before, said that by 2018 he would be able to summon his car from the other side of the country. Do you think that will happen? And I guarantee happen? you, you will see a video of him doing that, and it will have no, not the commercial <laughs> impact. You won't be able to do that, yeah. but he will be able to do that. <laughs> This is the problem. It's, you and I have discussed this on occasion. It's what I call AI theater. It's this gratuitous anthropomorphism in most cases, like uh, the Jeopardy win where you see a, a head uh, you know, thinking about what's going on when it's really just a computer in the back room. And it, it creates the impression like that there's somebody home, that there's a person there, that there's a, a mind behind it. But that's nonsense. There is no mind behind it. And uh, there's no reason that, that we should see those kinds of things as, as, uh, as real. So the problem is you can't distinguish what's real from what's not real. Something that has been a recently uh, an important issue in the uh, presidential election. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to that. Okay. But I, I want to talk to you about this idea of our tendency to anthropomorphize yes. almost everything. So you can't just blame the AI researchers for that. We as a species tend to, to turn anything, our, our, our pets, our, our cars into things that we can have relationships with. So yes, that's fundamentally a religious or spiritual concept. And it, it, it's uh, certainly worldwide. There's, uh, in Japan, there's the concept of uh, Shintoism. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but it's that every object has a spirit. And the spirits may be different for different kinds of objects. But I think that this kind of anthropomorphism leads us astray when we think about the practical effects of these technologies, and it blinds us to what we can do and what things we need to be careful of with these new technologies. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna start to, we're not gonna have a separate question session. I'm gonna try to weave these in to the degree I can without breaking us up too much. But before I go there, yeah. um, AI boom now, um, is it a bubble, will it end badly? It is a bubble, I don't think it will end badly but it will be disappointing for the people who are getting million dollar salaries coming out of Stanford. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, and so tell us a little bit about that. The, the people, I mean, well, you, how, bad, <laughs> uh, how, how good or bad is it? I get this by reading your work in the New York Times. So uh, this is the echo chamber going around and around now. It's really quite I think, they, what do they call this intelligence community? Blowback. This is blowback. Well, okay, I'll tell you one story. Go ahead. <laughs> so, because I've tried to chronicle, um, you know, I keep looking for uh, signs of a bubble top, and uh, there are many now. And my, one of my favorites about AI is um, there's a, um, a researcher who's teaching the undergraduate machine learning class at Stanford right now. And the recruiters come, this is undergraduate of course, the recruiters come after the first three weeks to try to take his students to work in startups. It's really that bad, um, which is really quite, I mean, it is the moral equivalent of plastics from Dustin Hoffman's movie. That, that, that's, that's, that's true. Absolutely, machine learning. You, you, that's well, it. but this is a self-correcting problem because obviously uh, the salaries are very inflated. Uh, the uh, delivery of economic value will be less than what is being invested, as is often the case, as you know, in the technology industry. And, uh, the, and more and more people are learning uh, due to uh, the excellent work of people like Sebastian Thrun, you can now take online courses and learn machine, uh, go into machine learning. There's nothing magic about it. It's uh, just another course in another subject. The problem is we're not grinding out enough people to meet the demand at the moment for the, those kinds of uh, activities. Since you talked about Sebastian and Google, there's mm -hmm. a question here that will take us a little bit of uh, a feel, but let's ask it. Um, sure. What do you think about Google buying up all of these AI labs, such as Boston Dynamics and other notable companies? And do you have any information on what they have been doing with them? I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you all. <laughs> Where's the HAL 9000? <laughs> um, do I have any, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> do you know what they're doing? What's, why is Google investing in robotics? They have too much money. <laughs> um, well, they're investing in robotics because clearly a uh, wave of one of the major things that's going to be happening in the future is the application of AI technology to uh, mechanical and mechanically engineered devices of all kinds. So when we say robotics, this is another area in which the public has a great deal of misconceptions. There's all kinds of work that's constantly been going on for literally for hundreds of years on building better and more capable machines of all different kinds. But somehow, and this goes back to you, an earlier point you made, if you design them so they kind of vaguely look like a human, you know, they got a head, they have arms, 
you know, or whatever it is. Now it's a robot. Well, a robot is just a machine. N nothing more, nothing less than that. But when you combine those advances in mechanical engineering with the new wave of applications of artificial intelligence, which we haven't gotten to this, but are basically about uh, being able to uh, engage in sensory perception, to be able to see the environment and to boil that down into some kind of actionable computerized form, uh, that becomes a very powerful combination which makes it possible to automate all kinds of tasks that previously required human intervention or attention. And so that's why it's going to be important. So, so um, you know, I'll, I'll answer part of this question because sure. I did some of the re first reporting on Google's foray into robotics. And Andy Rubin, who's since left, began acquiring a number of robotics companies over, yes. over a pretty short period of time and put together a team. And Andy's vision, as he was describing it to the people he was trying to hire at that time, is the Google car would drive up to your house and the Google robot would hop off the back bumper and run the package up to your up to your door. And if you're competing with Amazon, that makes a, a lot of sense. Now, so my question is that machine learning has done a lot. There is this problem of autonomy, of actually moving around and making decisions in, in unstructured environments. And you were talking about robots. You know, where we saw, where robots are today was, was sort of, I think, highlighted by DARPA's um, recent contest um, in, in, in uh, this was, I guess, almost two years ago two now, years ago. Bu building rescue robots, they didn't do a very good job. No. So if you take those machine learning techniques and you apply them to this problem of moving around in unstructured environments, uh, living amongst us, are robots going to be able to do that anytime soon based on the progress we've made in machine learning? I, I think that the answer to that is largely yes, it's all a question of timing, as you know. Uh, everybody's aware that one of the first applications of this is to autonomous driving. That's a great example. We have sensors that take in information about the environment and they're used to control a machine. Now, if you think about what a driver does when you drive a car, you're not really doing anything other than saying, recognizing where objects are and where people are and whether there's a red light. And then you can turn the wheel, you can press the brake or you can press the gas and that's it. Well, there's, that's an example of these kinds of technologies which used to be restricted to factory floors because they couldn't see and were dangerous and you couldn't get near them coming out of the factory floor and coming into human society. But the primary constraint I think we're going to see is not the capability of these machines to do these things. It's really um, our ability to design these machines so they abide by human social conventions. And that's going to be a big problem, starting with the uh, autonomous vehicles. There's all kinds of circumstances where we have a, a lot of unstated uh, social conventions that we abide by in how we walk through crowds, or when you give up your seat on the subway, or even how you behave when you drive, when you signal somebody to cross, or whether you make eye contact with another driver. And these are unstated, these aren't laws, and they're very hard to capture in a machine-compatible uh, form. So I think we're going to see a great deal of friction in a number of areas as these uh, devices come out into the field. To take yeah. the example, uh, you were talking about uh, Andy Rubin. You know, like, uh, the robot's going to hop off and run up to your front door. Well, is he going to run right over your roses? <laughs> it, it, what happens when the dog chases? You know, is he going to shoot the dog? I, what is going to happen? Um, when you're driving, you know that it's perfectly okay if you see a child run out into the street to veer to the left across a double yellow line. But that's illegal. And what are we going to do? Are we going to permit our automated cars to engage in that kind of behavior? Is it okay if the speed limit's 55 for your autonomous driving car to go 75 when that's the safe thing to do because everybody else is doing it? These are the kind of social conventions and rules which have been designed for human consumption, which we now need to incorporate a whole new class of device into. Yeah. You know, you know, uh since we have, we're surrounded by uh, robot cars, prototype robot cars. Some of them have gotten kicked out of San Francisco, but they're all over the place, particularly down in the valley. They're all, right. and the AI designers are actually trying to think about this. And what I've noticed about the prototypes I'm seeing is they're all getting interesting lighting systems and kind of eyebrows because they're trying to create you a language to communicate. to communicate with people. Yes, well, I'm involved in a project at Stanford. You it's know. doing that. It's yeah. doing that. I so, mean, how do, how, we were studying how do people move in crowds? You know, when is it okay to move forward or not? 
you can't just have a robot that stops when there's anybody around. That's bad, too. And so it uh, turns out we abide by all kinds of strange uh, subconscious rules, and we need to codify those rules and make yeah. the machines act in a socially appropriate way when they're around human beings. So uh, China as a competitor is now on, the, uh, mm -hmm. on our radar because of our soon-to-be president. Um, and I wanted to, you spent time in China recently, and I wanted to ask you to compare and contrast the sort of state of the art of China as an AI power to be and the United States. Um, are, are we ahead of them? Are the Chinese catching up? Do you have a sense of whether we'll be able to keep our lead in AI, and does it matter? Um, this is a, a lot of complex uh, questions embedded in that. Uh, of course, when I was in China, and in fact, any time I travel internationally, I get this question all the time, how are we going to keep up? Well, places like Google and Facebook and others, of course, they're regarded as the leaders. But there are very good people working on this all around the world. And it's not going to be very long before uh, all of those places and people are capable of doing the same quality of work and producing the same kinds of results as we do here in the United States. Arguably, that may be the case today. Um, so I think it's, it's, a, it's a mistake to think that we have the lead in this and that we're going to maintain the lead in this. We may be the most visible uh, in terms of the media and the announcements and all the you know, big investments and all that. But there's a tremendous amount going on, particularly in China. And, it's, and there's an argument, pretty good argument to be made that China will be earlier to de deploy and get economic value out of a lot of these technologies than the US for one, primarily one reason, which is they can get things done in a way that we can't get things done here. Uh, the government can say, we're going to stop all traffic in this city and we're going to turn it all into autonomous cars. And it happens. And that's why they're able to make great progress on things like global warming once they make a, a central decision to do so. And the same thing would be true for the deployment of artificial intelligence technologies. Whereas here in the US, if we said, OK, it's uh, San Diego, that's it. No more cars. You can imagine what, what would happen. OK, we're getting a lot of questions. And I, wanna, I don't want to dominate this. Hard, but this one I'm asking just because it's fun. It's off track. But um, it's Seth Shostak, who's the, uh, the physicist head of SETI, the Search for ex ex Extraterrestrial Intelligence, thinks that most life in the universe is probably artificial. What do you think of the proposition that carbon-based life is the first evolutionary step toward the creation of the ultimately dominant form of, quote, life, artificial life? That's a really... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I think it's all a question of what you mean by life. <laughs> I, I, I mean that seriously. Um, the idea that we're sort of uh, the precursor to machines that are better than us and take over is, to me, that's just a fantasy. It's a, it's a science fiction fantasy. We're part of a long lineage of uh, biological life on Earth, and these machines are not competitors to us. They're really nothing more than tools. You know my, my point of view, and it's all in my, my book uh, about this. Really what artificial intelligence is broadly misunderstood, because it's not really about intelligence at all. It's about automation. And when we're building machines, those machines will serve us. Otherwise, we won't build them and we won't use them. If they run amok and they take over, uh, let me go back to the HAL 9000. It kill in this story, for those of you, people under 40 haven't seen the film, I've learned. Or if you're over 40, I won't ask for a show of hands. <laughs> but uh, uh, you probably remember that the, the, the computer kills these people. I, it's like, my god, the thing ran amok. My reaction to that today is, boy, that's a really lousy design. Wouldn't you program the machine like, it's not OK to kill people. That's all you have to do. It's not like it comes alive itself and makes this decision. It's a design problem. Just as if I built an automated lawnmower that tended to run over children and dogs. You know, that's a bad design. So <laughs> we have great control over this technology. We have nothing to fear from it. And it's merely an advance in the longstanding process of automating tasks. So uh, I don't really see that we're on the stepping stone to something else. That's almost a semi-religious concept about what life is and what it would mean for us to be mechanical and all of that. Um, you know, the, the people are going to be around for a very long time. OK, we'll, we'll, we'll pick up that a little bit more, longer, but I, I want to sort of stay on that. So another thing that Elon Musk was famous for was saying that artificial intelligence might be our, or would be our biggest existential threat. Yes. Um, so to flip that around, what do you think, uh, 
what's your understanding of all the efforts um, that are going on right now to create uh, so-called ethical AIs? You sort of stepped into that, but we, all over this industry, uh, there, there are uh, corporations and nonprofit organizations and individuals who are sort of trying to, s to build these things that they, they think of as ethical AIs. Is it possible? Well, you're so, you're, you sort of just said that, but... Yeah, it, it's absolutely possible. But look, we're kind of conflating two things. There's this uh, media industry, uh, you know, TV, uh, movie kind of entertainment industry idea that these things are going to rise up and take over. And we've all seen it. They're evil. If they weren't evil, it wouldn't make a good movie. But that's not really the case at all. Uh, I come back to my, my point about uh, design. Um, so that's one, uh, one aspect of this. Worrying about ethics of AI, that's reasonable because there are some real issues that are going to come up. But uh, to me, there's the broader question of how do we make them behave in socially appropriate ways, which is a, a generalization of this notion of can we build ethical machines. But the idea that you're going to invest in ethical AI and non-ethical, what about databases, John? I mean, we're we going to build ethical databases, databases that can only be used for good and not be used to, to do evil. I mean, that's really the same thing. It's kind of silly, to be perfectly frank. You don't think, I mean, you're not being a little Pollyannish? I mean, you don't think that um, these technologies that are becoming increasingly powerful could be repurposed? Oh, absolutely. They can be used for bad purposes. There's no question about it. But we're kind of at the wrong level. I mean, databases can be used, uh, you know, for for evil, and uh, you know, a knife can be used to kill people, or it can be used to cut cut vegetables. Um, so it's a technology, and it can be applied broadly for activities that we would regard as socially acceptable, or it can be applied in ways to kill people. And but, in some cases, we think that's a good thing too. But you're you're sort of sort of making the a hammer is a hammer is a hammer argument. But right. isn't there? I mean, even if these things are not self-aware, right? Um, isn't there this mid-level where if they're autonomous and they're making decisions, there is some programming that's been inserted and it has values? I mean, that's real, isn't it? Or it will be real shortly. I, I do think there is a mid-level here. It's a little subtle, but you, know, you and I probably could, could talk about this. Um, you, you probably want to uh, establish uh, engineering standards, I would call them, is a, is a neutral way to put it for ways in which we want to uh, permit these programs to engage in, so we, to use a technical term, degrees of freedom of activity, and to limit those in certain respects in order to avoid the worst possible outcomes. And I think that's reasonable. And if you want to think about that as ethics, that's, that's perfectly fine. But I don't think there's anything inherent about the technology that it's good or that it's bad, or that you can build a version of it that can only uh, be an angel and another one that can only be a devil. I, I just, I don't see it that way. But we're on the cusp of having wep weapon systems that can um, detect humans and could yeah. kill them without humans. I could um, build that. I could build you one today for a very low price. Be extremely dangerous. And all you got to do is take the technology that's in your phone, hook it up to a uh, uh, machine gun yeah. uh, that, you know, just goes around, shoots at anything that moves. Well, uh, you, you know, this is a, that would be a very bad thing to do. My answer is, let's not do that. <laughs> you know, it's really pretty straightforward. Well, okay, by the so same... So where's the evil? Is it a machine gun? Is it evil? But it's a bad the, design. Do you think it's possible for us... There is, before the United Nations, now an active effort to restrict yeah. this generation of autonomous weapons. Do you think it's possible to... Um, you know, we, we've, largely, uh, uh, we've largely limited CBW weapons, chemical biological weapons. We've largely limited nuclear weapons. Is it possible to limit autonomous weapons? Um, I think that it's possible to try. It, the, the big problem, as you know, is to characterize what you mean by that. But of course, it is possible to engage in treaties where we're not going to uh, build devices that have certain capabilities. But um, the history of that is not, not suggestive there may be other parties that don't agree with you and uh, don't abide by the, those kinds of uh, uh, Geneva Conventions, if you will. Yeah. But the real issue, the military issue, is a very real one. And uh, just so the audience knows, and you know, there's a lot of activity going on in this. I mean, people who are very seriously advising the government, the government is very concerned about the abuse of this kind of technology for dangerous purposes. Uh, the uh, UN has a standing group that meets regularly to try to sort out these issues before they become you know, enormous uh, weapons of mass destruction. 
Um, but th there, the real problem is this. Like any great new technology, what it does is it reduces cost and it improves effectiveness. And today, weapons of mass destruction mostly are the province of uh, state actors, I think is the term. So you have to have a lot of money to go build a nuclear weapon and to deploy that in, in, a, in a way that, you know, to deliver it. But the technologies for artificial intelligence can be used to kill and harm an awful lot of people very quickly at very low cost. And that's really scary. And I think that people are very concerned about it because it means that non-state actors and organizations that we would regard as uh, evil uh, will be capable of building and deploying systems that do a great deal of damage much more effectively than just setting off a bomb in Times Square. Yeah. Uh, th w uh, this is the number of the questions here. This one is, uh, you've just sort of spoken it, but uh, concern regarding, you've spoken about it, concern regarding robocars, easy suicide bombs. Oh, There's yeah. been a, a, a popular science fiction book, I think it's called Demon, on, on this subject. And, uh, and I believe that this is actually real in Mosul today, mm -hmm. that there are autonomous vehicles that are being used to attack both sides. I, I don't know that. I haven't driven around Mosul recently myself. But the... Uh, uh, but it's true, they, these things can be extremely dangerous. If you don't have to lose your own life to deliver a car bomb, there are going to be a lot more of them, and uh, they're going to be deployed in, in a lot of different ways. And it's not just vehicles. There's all kinds of uh, ways uh, that, that these technologies can be, can be used in a very targeted way uh, that, that they have not been able to before. You know, imagine a little flying, like, insect-like uh, devices that can identify a human being, go up and just shoot a little bit of poison into your eye, and you're dead. Uh, there was a, uh, I was surprised to see that on a, a TV show recently. Uh, Black Mirror had a, uh, I was, uh, hey, yeah. these guys are really on it. I was surprised they knew about that as a real possibility. And if you want to get scared, go watch that. Be because that's not as crazy as it, as, it, uh, as it sounds. It will be technically feasible fairly shortly. Now. But let me talk about the positive side, if I could, for a second. I don't want to scare, <laughs> scare the life out of this wonderful audience. There's, for the people who are here on the radio, everybody already left the room, so um, uh, <laughs> they're, all, they're all going home to lock their doors and whatever it might be. Um, if, you th if, you, if this were 100 years ago, and we said, someday we'll have flying machines that people can use in the air, we might have two experts sitting here on a panel. Let's call them John and Jerry. And John might say, oh my God, what are we gonna do? You'll be able to take an explosive device, put it on one of these things, fly over a city and just drop it, and you can't stop the, uh, this uh, flying machine from destroying entire cities from the air. And, and the world is going to go crazy. It's going to be a, a disaster. And uh, Jerry might say, you know, I, I believe that in, you know, in 50 years, years time, you know, you'll, you'll be able to fly uh, in, in uh, five hours from, uh, San Francisco to, to New York, and it's going to be great. And every, everybody is going to uh, you know, have a whole new concept of mobility, and it's going to transform the economy and all that. And the funny thing is, both of, both of the old Jerry and the old John would have been entirely correct. And yet here we are. The same thing will happen with these artificial intelligence technologies. We're going to be scared to death by some of the things we hear about, some of the things we see, and the attempts to control them and to prevent their deployment and development will be very real. But there's, the benefits are also enormous. And I think in the end of the day, we'll muddle through and we'll figure out how to make it work just as we have with the concept of an airplane. Let me bring it back to Silicon Valley. Um, is, this, uh, is this a race that's gonna go on between the five giant American companies we might add, Baidu and Tencent and some others? I mean, is this a race that goes just to the companies that have access to big data, who control huge amounts of data. Is there any hope for tiny innovative startups to, uh, aside from becoming aqua hires, being, you know, being talent, talent pool for the, for the big companies? Yeah, for people who don't know, that means an a hire for the purpose of acquiring, I'm sorry, an acquisition mm -hmm. for the purpose of really yeah, hiring the staff. That's called an aqua hire. Which is what's going on now. But yeah. how, how much are we already locked in to these five big platforms? Not at all. Uh, that's my belief. Um, the, I need to explain something that the audience might not be aware of. The main thrust of the current wave of artificial intelligence is an area called machine learning. 
And machine learning is really a collection of techniques for uh, finding actionable information or patterns in extremely large collections of data. So when you see that uh, your, your phone can identify a face in a picture, that's because the data has been analyzed from an enormous number of photos where faces have been uh, identified. And that information has been uh, implemented even in something as straightforward as, as your particular phone. Um, so uh, machine learning, as it turns out, is based on the availability of large volumes of, elect of, of data available in electronic form. And what we've seen is an explosion of that with the internet and with the kind of connectivity that we have and cloud computing. So we've got so much more data, that's why this technology has become so much more valuable, machine learning. Now, what is you're correct about is the big companies have a lot of the data. Who else has a lot of data? That's the question. The government has a tremendous amount of data. And there's lots of data in smaller companies, which can be leveraged and used. Uh, healthcare, uh, you know, can be, the data can be shared and generalized, and the lessons learned from doing so through machine learning can be generally applied much more broadly. But anybody who's got a collection of data right now, it's a gold rush. If you have a big collection of data, then you're going to try to use machine learning techniques to see what kinds of actionable information you can extract out of that. So I don't think it's a big company versus a little company thing. It's all about data and who has access to the data. So whether that data is owned by these big companies is going to make a big difference in how successful they're going to be. Okay. Uh, let's take a break for a second. We're halfway through, and I'm supposed mm -hmm. to read this commercial um, announcement. So let me do that, and we'll come right back to it. I have a follow-up question for you. Uh, this is the Commonwealth Club of California program, and we are talking to Jerry Kaplan about his new book, Artificial Intelligence, What Everybody Needs to Know. I am John Markoff, uh, until recently a technology reporter for the New York Times and your moderator for today's program. You can listen to Commonwealth Club programs on the radio or podcast, watch your YouTube channel, check out your, our website, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. So na yeah. now back to our regular scheduled program. John, can I... Can I Interrupt you for sure, uh, sure. Interrupt your, your <laughs> commercial. I just want to take a public moment to thank John, not just for his this evening, but uh, John mentioned that he he's uh, recently retired. Uh, many of you have read his work, his remarkable work, decades of work, uh, explaining technology and science to the uh, to the general public. And his commitment to truth and accuracy is unparalleled, and is characteristic of uh, the great reporters from the New York Times. Uh, you may not. May know he he won a, uh, a Pulitzer Prize for uh, some of his reporting, and recently I've become really sensitive to the idea that uh, how can I put this that uh, an assault on the truth is really an assault on democracy, and I want to thank on behalf of the tech community and the business community and our audience, if you allow me, the audience here, thank John for his service to our country for the outstanding job that he has done for us. Thank you very much. One more thing. <laughs> I, the other thing I want to tell you is, uh, John and I have known each other for a while. A while. So they say we're, we're men of a certain age. And uh, I think we first met when uh, he I wrote, wrote a, I don't know, must have written some article in which my name appeared in the New York Times. And uh, in contrast to what I was just uh, telling you, my mother called me up and said, Gerald, your name is in the New York Times and it's misspelled. <laughs> it's misspelled. What are you going to do about that? And I said, Mother, I don't know. Why don't you call the reporter and tell him off? <laughs> and she did. <laughs> so. I've spoken to Jerry's mom on the phone. I've never actually met her. <laughs> but where I was going before... before uh, um, so Sorry. these algorithms, machine learning, by and large now requires vast amounts of data. Yes. Um, that's not the way you and I learn. Um, you know, if we see two or three examples of something, we, we tend to know it. You touch your hand on a hot stove once and you've learned. Um, there is another thread in the AI community, which I think is called sparse data rather than big data. How promising is that? And I guess I'm asking by that by the way, by the way of sort of how far are we along on this machine learning journey, and is this the technology that's going to take us to autonomous machines, or do you think there are breakthroughs that will 
that will upset the apple cart? Well, you use the term autonomous machines like many of the uh, descriptive terms in artificial intelligence, including artificial intelligence itself, machine learning, neural networks. These are uh, overly uh, optimistic, anthropomorphic uh, kinds of uh, uh, terms. So when you say an autonomous vehicle, what that means to the audience in general and what it means to you and me as technologists is a very different thing. I, you know, your car will be, uh, I'm quoting a friend, I uh, should mention that, I didn't make this up, but he said, your car will be truly autonomous when you tell it to drive you to the office and it takes you to the beach instead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to remember his name. Uh, Brad Templeton. Brad Templeton, thank you. Brad, Te Brad if you're out there. <laughs> Hats off to you. Um, but that really illustrates the difference. Autonomous, oh my God, who knows what they're going to do? That's the public reaction. What it means really is that there's a, a wide variety of degrees of uh, action that the device can take and that uh, based upon large amounts of data, it's very hard for you as a human to look at it and predict exactly what it's going to do. But that doesn't mean that it's autonomous in the sense that it's going to come alive or have its own desires or, you know, drink your wine or steal our women or whatever it might be. It's a very different uh, technical concept of the term. Yeah. So I don't know if that's an answer to your question, but it's an answer to some question <laughs> and I'm going to stick with it. So this, this one's fun. Um, this is uh, going in a slightly different direction, but let's go. Um, I heard a program on NPR on AI that said that there is an AI project to make a person immortal. Um, the AI learns everything about you from all your digital footprints, social media, and your family and friends. After you die, the AI responds if, as if you would have. Have you heard of this? Let's talk about AI and immortality, which sort of takes us down the road to... If you think that a machine that can mimic your behavior is you, God bless you, you're immortal. You'll be immortal. But I, I look at it this way. If I went back 100 years, my grandmother, who was born in the year 1900, as a matter of fact, she probably only had stories and maybe one picture that remind her of her, of her dead relatives. Uh, when she died, we actually, before she died, we, we had a videotape. So now my children and my children's children will have a you know, more active uh, view of uh, what, what she was like. Now, if in 30 or 40 years we can make some approximation of your behavior in a, in a program of some kind that mimics you or seems like it's like you. Um, and you can put it on your mantelpiece and your kids can go over and press the button and say, you know, hey grandpa, what would you do about this? You know, and it can say something that, that it, it's not gonna be very intelligent, but it may say something similar to what you get when you talk to Siri on your phone, but customized to you. Uh, you know, to me, I call that grandpa in a can. And uh, don't mistake that for it being conscious or being you, you're good, just, I promise you, everybody in this room, I've got good news, you're all gonna be dead. And uh, this idea that somehow copying all this into a machine is transferring you is a mytho mythological, almost a religious, spiritual concept for which there is absolutely no scientific support whatsoever that such a thing will happen despite what we see in the movies today. Yeah. I, you know, what we haven't talked about yet, and, and I see time moving on, so I don't want to let it uh, skip away, is, is about the pace of automation and its impact yeah. on society. We, we're, we're, we're remiss in not going there, but um, one, do you buy the idea of exponential change that we're actually accelerating? And secondly, if these technologies are increasingly going to impact the workforce, um, how quickly and what job categories are at risk? Where are you on that question, which is still hotly contested? in the society, ec economists, technologists, everybody has a different position. Where are you? Well, I, and I let me point out that Jerry is also the author of a book called Humans Need Not Apply, a very optimistic sounding title. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's the question of whether the pace of automation is accelerating is an interesting one. I think there's some evidence for it. And uh, there are other uh, I'm trying to remember the names of economists who have studied the past 30 years and say that's not really Robert happening. Robert Gordon comes to mind. Yes, yeah. uh, Robert yeah. Gordon, excuse me, yes. Um, but uh, the, the fact is, here's the facts on this. We have a new set of technologies in artificial intelligence that have applicability primarily because of the availability of large volumes of data, and they can be used to solve new classes of problems. There's a lot of 
tasks, I would call them jobs, but tasks that people perform, which basically involve, for example, hand-eye coordination, like driving, or like uh, tending a garden, or painting a house, um, many, many uh, manual labor uh, activities uh, meet these, this kind of criteria. And the truth is, in the next 20 to 30 years, we will have devices that can do these things. I don't think we're going to find them as surprising as we might if we, the first time we see them. But don't be surprised if you see little robots climbing buildings and painting them, or uh, uh, mowing your lawn. The gardener, instead of coming and, and using a leaf blower and a, and a mower, a gas-powered mower, as they do in my house, um, one person will come, set the stuff up, come back an hour later, pick it up, and it'll just do what it's supposed to do. So um, it is going to have an impact on labor markets. And, but there's nothing new about this, and it's very well understood how labor markets respond, as you know. So this is a self-correcting problem. There will all, I believe clearly there will be more jobs, different kinds of jobs. We'll be wealthier and better off for it. But like uh, globalization, the benefits are broadly distributed, but the costs uh, are concentrated on a very specific and identifiable group of people who will lose their jobs. And so that's a social problem that we need to deal with on a policy level. And I think these are things we need to pay attention to. Let's talk about one area in specific, transportation. Sure. Um, I think there are something like 1.7 million truck drivers. Um, there was a company that was started here called Auto, Auto that was yep. set out to automate trucks. Do you think the 1.7 million drivers are at risk anytime soon? I do. Uh, really? Now, when I say anytime soon, the question is, let's, what do you mean? Let's, let's, well, talk about, let's talk about a decade, horizon of a decade. Well, the, the, here's something people don't, may not realize, but the problem of getting an a automated Uber car is very, very hard for a lot of the reasons I was talking about. All the social aspects of how do cars pull over and what do they do and when do you go around. And uh, I'm, I'm not optimistic about seeing that anytime soon unless we change the infrastructure. That's a whole other discussion. But long haul truck driving, that's fairly automatable in a very near time horizon. We can eliminate those drivers. Now, uh, 10 years out, I wouldn't be surprised. I'm, uh, I uh, hate to make specific predictions, but I would be surprised if somewhere between uh, 20 and 50 percent of all long-haul truck driving is being done by automated automated uh, trucks by that time. That's that not means natural. the truck goes between the, the, the warehouse and the, and the supermarket. No, no, that's not what I mean. Uh, and now I want to get to this issue of you have to uh, adjust. You really get the benefit when you fix the infrastructure. What you do is you have the trucks that we have today, driven by people that we have today, and there's a staging area right off the major highway. And they drive it there, and then they program in where it's supposed to go. There's a dispatcher, sends it. It leaves San Francisco on Route 80, is it? And, uh, you know, uh, uh, two days later, it runs out of gas at, at another stop where it's refueled, and on to New York. It drives 24 hours a day. It doesn't get tired. It doesn't get sick. It doesn't need a rest stop. Uh, it doesn't get distracted. It's not on its phone. It's much safer, it's less expensive, and it arrives at a staging area, let's say outside New Jersey, and then is taken, taken on from there. Yeah. So uh, like many technologies, the, the real benefits aren't obvious until, aren't, uh, don't become realized until we change the infrastructure to accommodate these. The same thing if you go back and study the introduction of the automobile in New York City, Wonderful example of how it changed the way streets were used. They didn't have lanes 100 years ago. They didn't have uh, stoplights. And uh, people would play in the street, and the horses would go around them. Children would play in the street. Well, we had to change all that to accommodate the automobile. We will accommodate the automated vehicle in very much the same way. What, what are the second order effects? What are the things we aren't thinking about? Well, one of the things that like, always obsesses me is if Driving is, or going somewhere is as easy as pushing a button. Some robot comes and picks you up. Won't everybody want to go someplace at the same time? We might have well, fewer cars, but we certainly won't have fewer people wanting to go places. No, but right now, what's the average uh, car? Have you been on 101 recently? I mean, huh? uh, you know, I mean, it's... Yeah, but suppose you had four people in each car instead of one. Look, I'm sure you're, you're well aware of this. Let's just take your example of the automated car. Automated cars have uh, can be... When a highway, 101, here in, in San Francisco, is in full utilization, that is before it starts to slow down for a traffic jam, only 7% of the road surface is actually covered with a car. And that's because of our reaction time. Remember where the, the sensory device 
that drives it? Well, you need to keep a gap between you and the car in front of you. You know, they're always trying to teach you to keep four car lengths or five car, whatever it is. Now, these automated cars, they don't need that. They're more like uh, train cars. They can be right next to each other, uh, inches apart, traveling at extremely high speeds because firstly, they communicate with each other. And secondly, they can immediately see that the car in front of them is slowing down and they can uh, travel accordingly. So just if we could keep the same infrastructure and if we just got rid of the goddamn human drivers and put these automated cars out there, <laughs> we could uh, get uh, probably five times the capacity of the highway for without any any additional I investment. And you and yet you're saying that the problem of the you know the Uber robot the that that vehicle is not coming anytime soon. For well, the, it could for be technological for reasons. It no. If you're trying to integrate it with our current infrastructure, if you're trying to drive down Broadway over here or uh, Post Street, that's one thing. But if if uh, after these things get proved out a little bit, they decide that two of the lanes on Post Street are for automated cars only. You're going to see a dramatic increase in utilization of the resources, a reduction in cost, and your point, people will actually travel more, which will generate different and new kinds of jobs. Uh, that people will go out to eat more, people will uh, go shopping more, and, uh, and that's where our, the, the labor markets are very resilient yeah. as a result of this. So let me approach the jobs question from a different point of view. Are, you talked about repetitive work and, 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 and these machines taking over, increasingly taking over repetitive, repetitive labor. Are jobs that are commonly thought of as blue collar jobs more or less at risk than jobs that are thought of as white collar or, or, or higher status jobs? Where, where is this technology going to have its, its greatest impact first? Well, interestingly enough, if you think about artificial intelligence as being about intelligence, which I'm very much against, as you, you know, uh, you think, well, it's stupid now, so it can only do the jobs that stupid people do, and it'll get better over time. But that's completely the wrong way to think about it. There are different characteristics that make jobs automatable. Uh, they, jobs that have a specific goal, an objective measurement of success, and a set of uh, identifiable and uh, implementable techniques for getting from uh, the starting condition to the final condition, those are things which can be automated uh, relatively easily. And that is true for highly skilled work as much as it is for unskilled work. So we talked about, like, I think we're going to have fewer drivers. But most many people in AI realize or believe that uh, radiology, as an example, is a profession that will soon be almost completely automated. Because there's already systems out that can do a much better job of reading a, an X-ray and an MRI uh, than, a, than a human being can. And those are going to get rolled out, and radiologists are going to lose their jobs. In most professions, you have a range of activities that you engage in. Uh, lawyers, a lot of the work that lawyers do, it's not all in court going, you know, Your Honor, my, my client is not guilty. Uh, that's one kind of lawyering. Another kind of lawyer just does mundane contracts or does, uh, reviews what are called discovery documents. And a lot of those tasks can be automated. And so, looked at one way, you're making lawyers more productive which is code for we're putting a lot of them out of work. And uh, looked at an, uh, another way, um, I guess I said it, uh, did, you know, you're really, uh, you're just making it much more efficient and you're changing the nature of the job, just as the automated teller has changed the nature of the job for what tellers do in banks. Well, so you're, you're getting it, uh, we can sort of circle back to ethics again, because mm -hmm. it turns out that the, 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 the way he's framing at it, you know, extending humans or augmenting them versus replacing them is something that has been this tension within this field since the dawn of interactive computing. If you go back to Stanford University at the, at really, sort of 1962, 1963, there were two laboratories on either side of Stanford campus uh, the first interactive computers were designed there. One was called the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, and it was started by a guy by the name of John McCarthy who had coined the term artificial intelligence, and he thought that he would be able to build machines that would replace humans within a decade. This is 1962. And on the other side of campus, at the same time, same year, a man by the name of Doug Engelbart, who you probably know because he invented the mouse, um, he set out to build machines to augment humans. And you have this dichotomy that's actually existed and persisted through this industry to today where it's still this dramatic tension. But it's, a, it's both a dichotomy and a paradox because, of course, if you extend the power of a human, you need fewer humans. And, um, 
it's really quite striking that the industry is try still trying to settle this question. And I, I've, I, you know, in, in my reporting, I've been struck by um, this industry compared to some industries. I mean, some industries just resist regulation entirely, and they just, you know, cigarettes or, or oil, or they have a very anti-regulatory position. The computing industry right now is in a much more subtle posi position, and, and very smart technologists and um, CEOs are actually sort of trying to, to uh, they say, um, build systems that do AI for good, and they're, they're, they're struggling with this. I mean, you give them, is it, I guess my question is, is this marketing or is this industry somehow different than others? I, I don't think it's different than others, and I think the better way to uh, frame the question which I think takes a lot of this uh, uh, fraud emotional aspects out of it, is we build machines that perform specific tasks. And so it's a very simple question to answer whether you're helping people or whether you're replacing people. If you have a job, let's say that you perform nine or 10, let's say 10 identifiable tasks, if you can automate five of them, you're making that person more productive. And usually uh, the outputs of those tasks is something that is uh, augmenting the humans who are engaged in the other, the remaining five tasks. However, when you get to eight, nine, and 10, when you get to 10, you're out of a job. You just don't need the human being, so you can show them to the door and give the robot the job, so to speak. So we have to think of it at two different levels. It, it's not that the technology is designed to replace people. In fact, I think that's a, a bad idea as a design principle, because that makes it much harder and means that you won't get the value out of the technology as effectively. Or we can think of it as, let's look at the tasks that these people perform. If doctors are spending so much of their time engaged in some kind of routine, mundane activities, we can make them spend more time with their patients and be more effective by automating those, those activities. So if, if that's the way I look at it. And by the way, we didn't get back on this question of, well, who's not out of a job? A, a great example, I think nurses, are fundamentally unautomatable with the existing or foreseeable technology because they engage in broad problem solving, they engage in uh, interpersonal relations, they need to have good judgment, and these are things that, to put it mildly, machines are not good at. So there are many jobs like that, and they're not going away. Well, factor that into the healthcare system. IBM, with its Watson, its Watson technology, is making a big deal about a doctor's advisor. Yeah. So, but how does this, you know, healthcare is expensive. How do we deploy it? You could actually, you could actually make doctors better, or you could replace doctors and make physician's assistant better. Which, which should society do? Well, this is a difficult question because in a place where there are no doctors, they'll be perfectly happy to have a machine that does the job not quite as good as the best experts in the world. Uh, so I think that's a moral imperative to go ahead and do that. Now, whether or not we want to consign uh, the uh, less uh, uh, wealthy people in, in the United States to having to go see mechanical uh, electronic doctors uh, just because it's cheaper and that's going to cut health care costs, uh, we may not think that's very ethical uh, to do something like that. So I think it's a case-by-case -case basis, and it's a very difficult decision. Okay, so case-by-case. -case. Here's an audience question mm -hmm. to continue the theme. I am a sales guy selling CRM, Customer Relationship, Relationship Management Software. When is my job completely obsolete due to the tech innovation? What are the credentials of the sales guys of the future? Oh, um, when we think about what people do for a living, we, think of, we tend to think of what I'll call transactional jobs. And transactional jobs are, uh, you, know, you, you pay the plumber to fix the sink. When they're done, the sink is fixed, and you, you give them the money. Uh, but the, the truth is that there are a great many jobs that involve, inherently involve, person-to-person -person, uh, emotional or, or uh, connections. Selling is one of them. And there will always be a need for one-on-one -on -one personal selling. Uh, so our ability to connect with other people will become much more important in the future as a job skill our ability to persuade people, our ability to engage in handmade activities will become uh, much more valuable in, in the future as well. So uh, there's a whole range of jobs that uh, I, there's no notion of being able to uh, automate them. Nobody wants to go to a, an electronic bartender to tell, them, to tell the electronic bartender their troubles at the end of a day. <laughs> you know? 
no, nobody wants to go to you know, an electronic undertaker that says, I am so sorry for your loss, because you know there's nobody there. And the establishment of emotional connections between people is uniquely human and is critical for so many functions that people perform and get paid to perform. So I'm, I'm not that concerned. There's going to be plenty of work. The work will be different. So let me sort of pursue this from another per, uh, another angle and tell you a little bit about my experience. I, you know, I'm, I'm over a long period of time at, at, re, at sort of repeating intervals. We as a society have become anxious about automation. We're going through one of these periods right now, and some of my reporting sort of touched off this latest wave of anxiety. We began reporting about the impact of e-discovery software on right. legal profession 2010, 2011. Um, and I was in the hair on fire camp for a long time about automation. And something happened that changed my, my framing of, of, the, of the problem and really changed, me, changed the way I think about things. And it was having a conversation with Danny Kahneman, who's the um, behavioral economist. And I was basically saying, look at robotics, manufacturing robots are going to come to China and they're going to lead to disruption. And he stopped me and he said, you don't get it. He said, in China, they'll be lucky if robots come just in time. And I said, excuse me? And he walked me through the demographic situation in China, which of course is a rapidly aging population based on a one-child um, one birth policy. In the last year, 20, 2016, 2015, that year, the working age workforce in China declined by 5 million people. But it's more complicated than that in a really interesting way, which will lead to my question. Um, and it, this is actually true about the entire world with the exception of Africa. We are, as a world, aging much more quickly than anybody realizes. And um, there's this thing called the dependency ratio, and that's the, ra relation, the, the ratio between able-bodied and people who need care. And the dependency ratio is going in the wrong direction in a dramatically in a way that people don't realize. Um, the number of people today, for the first time ever, who are, um, who are over 65 outnumber the people in the world who are under five. The number of people who will be 80 or above in the middle of the century will double. It will go up by sevenfold by the end of the century. And so uh, the question that I've started asking, I don't ask about the, the robot car question, and the question I'd, I'd give, give you is when will there be a robot that can safely give an aging human a shower? <laughs> and there is great need for that, I might add. <laughs> uh, I don't know, <laughs> for an honest answer. <laughs> Which is the... Uh, yeah, I, I think, again, you, you, you think of it, uh, well, we're going to take the human and do what a human does and bring a robot in that does exactly the same thing. That's where we tend to think of this wrongly. How are we going to make it possible for people to safely take showers by themselves at older ages? That's the design of the shower, and it, perhaps the design of some technology that would, would help them or uh, brace them when they uh, can see that they're about to fall. That, so you don't need to solve the whole problem. You can solve certain parts of the problem. Um, and and that, yeah. that's a very, very real issue. We're, we're, we're running short we're of time, but short. there's one more aspect of this that I really wanted to get to. And I, so we've, we've sort of said that uh, automation and jobs is not an immediate crisis. What about inequality? Does, does technology play a role in immediate. fostering inequality? Absolutely. We don't have a lot of time to yeah. discuss this. But I'm here to tell you guys, Karl Marx, unfortunately, was right. He said that automation is the substitution of capital for labor. And we're seeing a great acceleration in automation. Now, the natural effect of that on our economy is that the people who have money to invest in automation, uh, who can buy the machines or design the machines, those are the ones who are going to get the economic benefits, particularly under our capitalist system. So unfortunately, automation is a force for increasing income inequality. We're seeing the results of that today. As you know, I wrote about that extensively in my previous book. And uh, to me, income, wealth inequality and income inequality in the United States is a national disgrace. Most people don't realize it's, as almost, it's pretty much as extreme as the uh, extremes are in Russia and in India. That's what it's like here today. And we're already seeing the political effects of that. And I would argue that it drags everybody down. Everybody thinks it's a problem, the wealthy and the, the, the less wealthy as well. And these are issues we're going to have to address on uh, an ethical, social level. Otherwise, 
things are really going to go to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are down to the... Let me see if I can find one more question to ask, because um, we're down... They're, they're, they go all in different directions. It's very... Um, Um, I'm Do you really believe the undertaker is sorry when he tells you that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, for people on the radio, the, the point was... Yeah, uh, repeat uh, the question if you could. Is it, they can pretend very well. <laughs> Do you think your, your wife loves you when she says she loves you? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's... That, that's a great... No, now we're back to fake news, and that's a great, a, a great point to close on. Um, our thanks to Jerry Kaplan for coming to talk about the state of technology, including his new book, Artificial Intelligence, What Everyone Needs to Know. And thanks to Accenture this evening for sponsoring tonight's, tonight's program. I'm John Markoff, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. Thank you.